Heavenly Father, I hide myself behind the cross of Jesus Christ. I pray, Lord, that this word would not go unheeded and that I would not cause anyone to stumble by the hearing of it. Bless your word, Lord. May it go deep, deep into our hearts and change us all. May we respond to what it is that you are saying to us this morning. And I say it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Now, I have entitled my sermon, A Sermon You're Not Likely to Applaud To. Because when God told me what he wanted me to speak on, I said to him, this is a message no one would want to applaud. <laughs> it is a word of chastisement. And sometimes they seem harsh. Who wants to hear them? They don't feel good. They don't tickle the ears. But nonetheless, God wants us to hear his voice on this. Not my voice, his voice. So I would encourage you to listen. It's important what he wants to say to us. I hadn't been able to sleep, although I had an ISOM exam in the morning. This was last Sunday. I would have loved to awaken refreshed and eager to take it, assured that I could do my best. But the reason I couldn't sleep was that God had placed a heavy word of correction for our church on my heart. The Lord wants to correct us because he cares about us and loves us so much. 1 Thessalonians 2.13 says, And we thank God continually, because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it, not as the word of men, but as it actually is, the word of God, which is in us who believe. The Apostle Paul wrote those words even as he was correcting in his letters the many errors in some of the churches he initiated. Jesus does the same thing in Revelation to the seven churches mentioned there. Correction is good for us. In Hebrews 12, 6, it says, My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline, and do not lose heart when he rebukes you, because the Lord disciplines those he loves, and he punishes everyone he accepts as a son. It isn't easy to bring this message to you. Some may think I'm being judgmental. However, I want you to know I'm not. It's not my job to judge anybody. Criticisms that have been said, I have heard them, both firsthand and secondhand, and even some from people who have been terribly hurt by the comments made against them and their ministries. And so the question has to be asked, what is a critical spirit? If you've taken the ISOM course, you'd know the answer to that. It is the spirit of Lucifer himself. That's very frightening to me. To think that the devil actually has a foothold in some of us and we're not even aware of him being in our congregation. We're living in a time where the devil doesn't even bother to hide anymore. We've been blinded a bit at a time until we no longer recognize him. The world certainly isn't aware of him, but we should be. You know, this kind of reminds me of a little story of the frog that you take out of a nice pond and you put him in a pot of water and he's quite comfortable. You turn the heat up underneath him and you would think the frog would get the heck out of that pot, but he doesn't. He becomes tolerant of the increase of the heat. I think as Christians, sometimes we become tolerant of the little things that Satan would use to trip us up. We all know that Lucifer, when in heaven, decided that he should be God. He should be making the decisions and the judgments. He felt that he knew better than God. After all, he was the most beautiful of the angels, the most musical. In fact, he led the choir. So how could he possibly have fallen? Well, I'm going to tell you how. Conceit and pride entered into his heart. That's how. With conceit comes the thought, I'm better than all the rest. That means I'm perfect. And all the rest should be like me. It's worth noting that a third of the angels agreed with Satan. And when Lucifer was cast from heaven, they went with him. They're now his demons, his little minions. And they are here, even now, plaguing the earth. And even some of us. You can read the whole episode of him being cast out in Isaiah 41, or 14, 1 to 32. 
but you can also find over a hundred more verses that are relevant to this event in any concordance. And there are far too many for me to list here. My, Satan's, my, my sermon's long enough without trying to list all them, let me tell you. As Satan's demons, their job is to attack the church from all sides, and yes, even from within us. Through us, the church, and the witness of our testimony not lining up with our behavior. One of their main tactics in order to do this is to cause pride, judgment, and criticism to rear its ugly head in us. We take on the spirit of Lucifer when we decide to criticize our brothers and sisters and even those who are not yet saved. We need to ask, are we like Lucifer? Do we actually think that God made a mistake when he made that person that we're finding fault with? Do we think we could have done a better job and that they should be more like us? Of course, we would all say we don't think that way. And I'm sure on a conscious level, we do not. However, underneath our cognitive thinking selves, there is unknowingly that very idea brewing in us. We really don't agree with how God made the person we're finding fault with, do we? Why didn't God make them more like me? I'm so perfect. Really? We think so? It doesn't take much honest examination of ourselves to find that we are not. I want to address some of the areas we seem to be finding the most fault with, the areas we're criticizing and judging. Here are just some that I personally know of, and to be honest with you, some that I have also fallen into that fault with. The worship team, the media booth, the sermons, the communion, the ushers, stand dancing, the way so-and-so dresses, and I could go on and on. My point here is not to point them out, but rather to bring to our minds some of our own thoughts. And yes, even some of our spoken comments regarding these areas. Just a quick reminder here, out of the heart, the mouth speaks. Luke 6, 45. What does your mouth speak? Blessings or curses? Encouragement or criticism? These are complete opposites. I want to point out here that God himself has given the talents to those who would serve him. What they have is what he has given to them. And I know that each person who's giving their time and talents to the Lord are doing their very best. When we are critical of them, we are saying God didn't do enough. He didn't bless them in the way that best serves and suits us, me. We would rather that he had given them more talent or a different talent. And that, my dear friends, my dear sisters and brothers, is the very spirit of Lucifer. I want to address another fact here. We do not know what God asked of those we are criticizing, do we? Do we know the heart of the person that's serving? Are they in their position only as a show? Or are they sincere of heart to serve the Lord? Can we really be the judge of that? Should we even try to be the judge? Personally, I think not. Only God the Father has the right to do that. Now, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Stan, because he's one of the ones that I know had criticism about his dancing. And I have his permission to speak, so I'm not revealing anything. As his wife, I know many things about him that you don't. I think I know him really, really well. But even I cannot and will not judge his heart toward the Lord. Proverbs 21.2 says, Every man's way is right in his own eyes, but only the Lord knows the heart. So since I'm talking about Stan, let's look at his dancing. It's not always pretty. It is not meant to be. It's not always in time to the music. And again, it's not meant to be. Why do I say that? Because if God wanted it that way, he would have made Stan able to dance in perfect rhythm with the music. He didn't. Sometimes it looks silly, at least to me. And I know to some of you, because I've heard the comments regarding his dancing. Some would rather he never danced again. And that might be pleasing to some of you, but not to God. I was recently told that Pastor Phil was asked by another pastor not to bring that man who danced to their church. Can you imagine a pastor asking that someone not be brought to church? Shame, shame, shame. Stan's dancing, folks, is not for us. It's not for our entertainment. 
His dancing is for the Lord. It's an act of obedience, an act of worship, perhaps not an act of beauty in our eyes, but oh, to God, it is beautiful beyond our limited, finite imagination. We don't know that the Lord didn't ask someone else to dance before he asked Dan. Someone who had a lot more talent and could wow us with his dancing. Perhaps, just perhaps he did. But that person was not willing to be used by God that way. God knew that Stan would be obedient, even if he looked foolish to man doing so. I should add that not everyone has been critical of Stan's dancing. A lot have been greatly blessed by it. I know because they have told us that they can feel the very presence of the Holy Spirit enter our sanctuary when Stan dances. So I'm not maybe speaking to the folks of you who are here, because I don't think anybody feels that way, but some have in the past. But I also want you to know this about Stan. He's a very humble man, and he would never want to bring attention to himself in any way. In fact, he refused to dance for a long time because of this very reason. What you may also not know is that many years ago, as we were standing during worship, the Lord told Stan to dance. At the same time, I also heard from the Lord that Stan was to dance. I told him, and he said, I know, the Lord just told me. The fact that he was to dance was immediately confirmed. There was no doubt about it. However, even talking to our pastor at the time, Pastor Tunicitis, and a couple of other pastors who were, I might add, very encouraging, Stan did not get up and dance. He knew he was supposed to, but fear of man and the knowledge that he had two left feet kept him in his seat. A pastor realized Stan's fear and took him forward and danced with him in front of the whole congregation while they sang, Dance Like David Danced. It was a very joyous moment in that little church, and everyone started to dance and genuinely praise God. They became totally free to worship with all their hearts, and they didn't care what it looked like. They were so engrossed with worshiping through dance, they didn't even see what was happening around them with everybody else. And this event gave Stan the courage to step out and be obedient to the voice of God. The fear of man was gone, and the fear of the Lord was made present in Stan's heart. Over our stage is the writing, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Do we really believe that? Or should we just paint over it and put something like, I'm all bound up and all chained up in its place? It's a repulsive thought, isn't it? But it's the truth. Most of us are all chained up and all bound up. Can't even raise our hands in worship. Oh, heaven, somebody might see me raise my hands in worship. I've just addressed the problem of a critical spirit with one of our members, Stan, but there are many others too. Since I don't know all their backstories and how they got where they are in the church, I'll not try to explain them. What I do know about each of these aforementioned folk is that they're doing what God has called them to do, and they are doing it to the very best of their God-given ability. They pray about what they are doing, and they hear from the Lord as to what he wants of them. And again, they're not here to entertain us. Who are we to tear them down? Can't we see who is behind the critical spirit in us? Are we so immature that we can honestly say we didn't know that it was wrong to behave this way? I don't think so. Please understand, I'm not criticizing you. If you're feeling troubled or convicted, it's not for me. I mean, I've had to go through this. It is Holy Spirit trying to bring correction to our hearts. Are you like me, yes, even me, finding fault in your brothers and sisters? I would urge us to confess, repent, and allow Holy Spirit to bring us to a place of reconciliation with God and with each other. We need to give our heads a shake and recognize our own flaws, because we do have some, folks. In Luke 6, 41 and 42, it says this, Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye? and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye. How can you say to your brother, please, brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when you yourself fail to see the plank in your own? It says, you hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye, then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. We need to examine our own flaws, and I might add, correct them, 
so that we can better assist our fellow man. Satan would like nothing more than to cause criticism and conceit to occur in our minds. This is the door he uses to get into the church and cause it to fail. Thoughts like, I could do that better, or even, that wasn't very good. Why do they have to do it that way, for example? This kind of behavior can cause a toxic environment of disunity, backbiting, quarreling, control, judgmentalism, and distrust. The distrust comes from hearing what has been thought and is now being spoken. We are afraid to allow ourselves to be genuine with that kind of person, afraid to reveal our weakness or to allow ourselves to be close to that person. We just shut down. We look around and upon hearing some of these critical comments, we think, where is the love? Do they talk that way about me? If we who have been coming here for a long time think that, how much more might someone who is new to the faith? What would they think sitting here? Who would want to be in such a place? Now, when I say here, I'm not necessarily, necessarily speaking about this tiny congregation. I'm speaking about the church in general. So please don't take offense. Even though our pastors work nonstop, tirelessly, and put everything they have into their ministry and call, this could be the very reason we're not seeing the multiplication of new converts in our church that was promised in the book of Acts if we preach the word of God. I have to wonder right now what you're all thinking about me. Is my sermon, sermon upsetting you? Is it too long? It's getting longer, I'll tell you. Too short? Is it too short? Am I belaboring the point? Should I dress differently or wear my hair a different way? Am I too fat? For sure I'm not too thin. Maybe you think no woman should be preaching at all. Would you have the courage to express those thoughts to my face? While I don't relish criticism, I am correctable when it's expressed in love. The word of God says, they will know you by your love one to another. John 13, 35. Are we showing love when we tear someone down? Especially someone doing their very best. Have you ever noticed that those who do the most criticizing are those who are sitting in their seats? They're not the ones doing the work, are they? Instead of criticizing, how about lending a hand or doing something constructive to make the ministry better? How about trying that? We should be lifting each other up and cheering each other on, not trying to outshine each other or tear each other down. What is wrong with us? Are we such baby Christians that we cannot see what is right above our nose, our brain, where we think, or what is right under our noses, our mouth, both can be very destroying to our souls. Before we even speak, it is in our mind that the devil begins to weak, work. He wants to control us. He wants to control our thoughts. Unknowingly, little by little, we've allowed Satan to slice away until sometimes there's not much left of our witness as a Christian. Remember what I said earlier, Satan doesn't even try to hide anymore because he doesn't have to? We don't seem to realize that he's at work in us. Now Satan has a couple of good qualities that we should all emulate. And when I said that at home, everybody looked at me like, are you nuts? But listen, here are three. He's not lazy. He never quits and he works tirelessly to get the job done. He is at work trying desperately to cause us all to fall away. He knows the time is short. If we tried as hard not to fall away, we could all be in a better place. Our mind is like a compass. It directs us along a path that mimics thoughts and habits. Therefore, we should manifest pure thoughts because eventually your way of thinking becomes habits and habits become our lifestyle. Of course, it is our mind and we can choose to think and believe whatever we want. But remember, Satan can influence our thinking and he is the wrong one to allow that privilege. We can say to ourselves, it's only my opinion. Don't I have a right to my opinion? Of course we do. We can all have an opinion as to what color our room should be such as our sanctuary. Nick Watson thought maybe lime green would be nice. We can express our expression and our opinions on what we should wear, even what car is best. But when it comes to an opinion about people, whose opinion is the right one? 
Yours? Mine? Or perhaps the one who created them in the first place? Jesus. He's the only one whose opinion should matter to us. Jake Woodard said something like this to which I've added my thoughts. Imagine your mind like a garden and your thoughts are the seeds. You get to choose which seeds you want to plant in it. You can plant seeds of negativity, criticism, and discord. Or you can plant seeds that will produce good relationships with God and each other. You could also spend your time trying to take care of everybody else's garden, making theirs like your own, not allowing them to choose what seeds they want or how to plant and water their own way. A pretty boring landscape would ensue. I think it best to tend to your own garden, making it as beautiful as possible and thus attracting others to yours. The same could be said about ministries. Take care of our own. And if we don't have one, that could be part of the problem. We just aren't busy enough to keep ourselves out of trouble. I read on Facebook the other day, and yes, there are some good things posted there. This little story that I believe Linda downstairs shared. And it goes like this. A lady went to her pastor and told him she would no longer be attending. When he asked her why, she replied that she saw people on their cell phones during the sermon. I hope nobody's got theirs out right now. That some were gossiping. Did I catch you? Oh, okay. <laughs> some were gossiping and some just weren't living right. She said, they're all a bunch of hypocrites. The pastor reflected on this for a moment, and then he asked her if she could do one thing for him before she left. And she said, of course. He asked her to walk around the church two times with a glass full of water, being careful not to spill the drop. She agreed. When finished, she returned to the pastor and said, I didn't drop any. It's done. He then asked her three questions. First, did you see anyone on their cell phones? Second, did you see anyone gossiping? And third, did you see anyone not living right? She said, of course not. I was totally focused on not spilling any water. He told her, when you come to church, you should be just as focused on God so that you don't fall. And that is why Jesus said, follow me, and didn't say, follow fellow Christians. Stay focused on God, not what the other person is doing. God will take care of correcting that person if they are flawed in their relationship with him. It is his job, not ours. Can you see the parallel here? Never mind what everybody else is doing. We need to do our best to fulfill the call God has for our own life. That in itself should keep us all far too busy to be busybodies looking at others. Why can't we be kind and compassionate, forgiving each other their faults, even as God overlooks ours? I just paraphrased, paraphrased Ephesians 4.32 here. When you see someone struggling to do their best, can't we just re rejoice in the fact that there are faithful servants in the house? We can change, and I want you to know that God expects us to respond to his correction. It is because he cares for his sheep and loves us that he even bothers to give us correction. He doesn't want any of us to be fooled by the deceiver because we're not walking close enough to him. Let's look at what the word says about God's correction. In Hebrews 12, 5b through 8, he says, My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline, and do not lose heart when he rebukes you. Because the Lord disciplines those he loves, and he punishes everyone he accepts as a son. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as sons. For what son is not disciplined by his father? If you are not disciplined, and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are illegitimate children and not true sons. Now skip down to verse 11. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Now check out Proverbs 3, 11 to 12. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline and do not resent his rebuke because the Lord disciplines those he loves as a father, the son he delights in. We can see from these verses that discipline is good for us. I remember the first time I read Hebrews 12, 5 through 8. It brought great joy to my heart 
because I was going through some really heavy stuff. I was a new Christian. I wondered where God was and what was going on. Why was I in such a hurtful place? My heart was breaking. But in the end, I could see what the Lord was doing. He was showing his love for me. And more importantly at the time, he was showing me that I was one of his because he was disciplining me. I needed his correction. It hurt. Oh, yeah, it did. But look at the difference it made in my life. The word from God may seem harsh to some, even very direct. But he is showing us his great love and patience toward us. So what do we do with this word? We need to dive in and see just what it is he wants us to do instead of what we've been doing. For one thing, let's surround each other in love and encouragement instead of criticism and tearing down. If we can see someone faltering, can't we encourage them and pray for them? If they are stumbling, can't we stoop to pick them up? If they're going through a storm, can't we just hold an umbrella over them? Gossiping about somebody's struggles isn't helpful. Prayer is. We would be far better to use the time for that instead. We all have flaws that could be pointed out, and it would be hurtful. We need to learn to hold our tongues in check. Concerning the tongue, James makes it very clear. James 3, 5 to 10. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider that a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue is also a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole person, sets the whole course of his life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and creatures of the sea are being tamed and have been tamed by man, but no man can tame his tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth comes praise and cursings. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. So folks, we should likely start there. Even if we had the brain of a goose, we could do better. And I, I'm going to explain this. As we all know, geese fly in a V. And there's several reasons for this. One is that when a lead goose gets tired, another can take over, and he can go to the rear where there is less wind resistance. I knew that. But this is what I didn't know about geese. When a goose starts to become tired, the other geese honk at him as a way to encourage him. The amazing thing is this. They can maintain 71% more productivity when they're being honked at. That is what the noise is all about as they fly overhead. That is what encouragement can do. Can you imagine 71% more productivity in our church? Can you even begin to imagine it? Just from a bit of honking. In other words, encouraging. The other thing about geese is this. When one falls prey to a hunter, two others leave the group and descend with him to see if it's all right. They stay with the fallen one until it's strong enough to fly again. They encourage it, they feed it, they look after it. But do we behave like that? The geese aren't gossiping about the, the fallen one. They're looking after it. So do we care enough about our sister to put herself in such a position? Or do we just wash our hands of her and carry on our own lovely way? Just a quick note, I learned all this in ISOM. About the geese, I mean. Sometimes our thoughts and opinions are better kept to ourselves and not spoken out where they can hurt others. But even kept inside us, they can cause damage to our own souls. Remember, the mind is the playing field of Satan, and I hear Trish say that all the time. Our thoughts can harm us greatly. It's in our mind that we first become conceited, proudful, and critical. It's there that we take on the spirit of Lucifer. So I say, be careful, little mind, what we think. We are to have the mind of Christ. Philippians 2, 1 through 5 says this. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourself. Each of you should not look only to your own interest, but also to the interests of others. 
your attitude should be the same as that of Jesus Christ. Here Paul makes it clear just how it is that we are to think and behave. He is calling us to follow the path the Lord took during his lifetime by continually sharing the attitude that Christ has. Can you imagine Jesus being critical of us, his beloved bride, when he stands before the Father on our behalf? I can't. We should also remember that we will be judged as we judge and forgiven as we forgive. And again, well-known scripture, Luke 6, 37. Do not judge and you will not be judged. Do not condemn and you will not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. Give and it will be given unto you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Based on this scripture alone, and there are many others too. I know I personally want to be very careful of what I think in the future regarding others. God does not beat around the bush or pussyfoot around when he brings about correction. The Israelites took 40 years to cross the desert. It was a trip that should have taken them 11 days. What took them so long? Well, right from the start, they were grumbling and complaining. Not enough food, for example. God gave them manna. They grumbled. So God gave them quail. Again, they crumbled, stating, we're better off in Egypt. Their fall started with complaining. The subtle spirit of Lucifer entered. Some didn't like the leadership of Moses. They were quick to make demands of Aaron when Moses took too long on the mountain. They fell to the point of worshiping a golden calf. God's judgment was swift. He struck them with the plague, and he refused to go further with them, as he had in the beginning. The plea of Moses caused God to relent, and he continued to lead the people. None of the 600,000 people, except for Joshua and Caleb, were allowed to enter the promised land. They all died in the desert. A generation that left Egypt perfectly healthy died off in a matter of 40 years. It is worth remembering that in the day of Moses, people lived a lot longer than we do now. Moses lived to the age of 120. He started his leadership at 80. Who of us at 80 or even 50 would strike out to lead 60, 600,000 people through a desert? A matter of 40 years should not have killed them all. But God could not allow an ungrateful, critical, complaining, sinful people into the land of milk and honey where they could continue to contaminate the younger generation. When I was a little girl of about five or six, my dad got me a pair of red sandals. He knew I loved red, and I still do to this very day. When he brought them to give to me, he discovered that I had done something wrong. And as a punishment, he showed me the beautiful red sandals to the delight of my eyes. Then he put them back into the box, never to be seen again. That, my dear friends, was my punishment. I do not recall what it was I did wrong, but I do remember the punishment to this day. I'm not a theologian, and I'm st I can stand to be corrected if I'm wrong here, but I do not believe our Heavenly Father treats us that way, nor do I believe he was punishing the Jews when he allowed the first generation of them to die off in the desert. The Jews had been promised a land of their own for a long time. While in Egypt, they longed to go there, so what happened between wanting something so bad and actually being well on their way to getting it? They thought they knew better than God. They longed to go back to Egypt. Personally, I believe they had to die off because God in his wisdom could not allow the spirit of Lucifer to enter into that promised land. He had to purify his chosen people. We see here that when we allow Satan a foothold, it can be a slow fall from grace but it can also be a quick decline. Do we, are we, like the people of Israel? Do we complain and find fault in how God made our leaders? Are we wandering in the wilderness like the Jews did, complaining and grumbling? Wouldn't we prefer to have the promises of God and move through giving him praise? God's punishment for our critical spirit could be us not receiving his reward. Are we seeing the souls coming to the kingdom of God that were promised when we preached the word? I don't think so. Our numbers in Canada and the Western world are declining. Just as the grumbling Israelites couldn't enter the promised land, 
the grumbling ones of us might not see the harvest of souls either. If we don't have a change of heart, we just might be the ones in the way of that harvest. We need to be purified. Our minds and our hearts have to change to reflect that of Christ. Do they? A lot of questions for us to think about this morning. Altar team, could you please join me up here? And Gord, if you could put that music up for me, I would appreciate it. If you, like me, have been moved by this word from the Lord, please come forward to receive prayer. You can receive forgiveness and a clear conscience, able to walk in the fullness of Father God's love. I know I personally need to repent of a critical, conceited, judgmental spirit. So I myself am stepping forward as an act of obedience to this word from God. Won't you who feel the same join me?